So friends, it was just reported that the Department of Justice will not prosecute Representative Matt Gates in connection with the underage sex trafficking investigation DOJ has had up and running for quite some time. We're going to take on the question of why federal prosecutors decline to bring charges. So let's talk about that, because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, we just learned that the Department of Justice will not bring charges, will not indict Representative Matt Gates in connection with the underage sex trafficking investigation that they have been conducting for quite some time now. And in today's discussion, we're gonna take on the topic of why do federal prosecutors decline to bring charges and as you can imagine, it is not a one-size-fits-all answer. But let's start with the new reporting, this from CNN. DOJ officially decides not to charge Matt Gates in sex trafficking probe. And that article begins, the Justice Department has informed lawyers for at least one witness that it will not bring charges against Florida GOP representative Matt Gates after a years-long federal sex trafficking investigation. Senior officials reached out to lawyers for multiple witnesses on Wednesday, a source familiar with the matter told CNN, to inform them of the decision not to prosecute Gates. The final decision was made by Department of Justice leadership after investigators recommended against charges last year. And then there's a quote from Gates' lawyers, quote, We have just spoken with the Department of Justice and have been informed that they have concluded their investigation into Congressman Gates and allegations related to sex trafficking and obstruction of justice, and they have determined not to bring any charges against him. Gates' lawyers Mark McCausey and Isabel Kirshner said in a statement, my friends, let me hasten to add, I'm not related to Matt Gates' lawyer, Isabel Kirshner. Last names are spelled differently. Now, I was a federal prosecutor for 30 years, and in those 30 years, I had to decline to prosecute lots of cases. So let's talk about why prosecutors, in particular federal prosecutors, sometimes decline to charge cases. Now, some of these answers are easy. Some of these answers are less easy. Some of these answers are acceptable, and some you might find less acceptable, particularly when it comes to the area of the relationship between federal prosecutors and state prosecutors or local prosecutors. And the reason I feel like I am sort of uniquely equipped to handle the question of you know the relationship between federal prosecutors and local prosecutors is because I did both things simultaneously. What do I mean by that? Well, the Department of Justice prosecutes federal crimes and only federal crimes. There are 93 United States Attorney's offices. Those are the field offices all across the country and in the territories where the trial lawyers are prosecuting federal cases. But one of the U.S. Attorney's offices of the 93 prosecutes all federal crime and all local crime. And that is the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. We do all the federal prosecuting and we do all the local prosecuting just as if we were state district attorneys. But because D.C. is not a state, hopefully that will change someday. D.C. is a city. They don't have a district attorney's office, so we, the federal prosecutors, do it all. So yes, I would prosecute federal cases and local cases, cases um, that arose in violation of D.C. local criminal statutes. I would prosecute them at virtually the same time. So I was the federal prosecutor and the local prosecutor. 
And the, the relationship between federal prosecutors and local prosecutors can be challenging. So let's try to, to work our way through some of the most usual cases where prosecutors decline to bring charges. Let's start with an easy one. No crime was committed, right? For example, something might be reported as a kidnapping. Maybe a criminal investigation is open and during the course of the investigation, it is learned that no one was kidnapped, but the person who went missing actually, actually left completely voluntarily with another person. Obviously, no crime, no charges brought. That's the easy example. Another relatively easy example. Um, there might be a crime, for example, a homicide, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart because I was chief of homicide at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office for years, responsible for overseeing all murder investigations in the grand jury and all murder prosecutions in court, and I had to make charging decisions many times. So there were times when we knew a crime had been committed, there was a homicide, there was a murder, but we couldn't solve the case. We couldn't develop enough evidence to identify the perpetrator. So, of course, no charges were brought. Sometimes we knew there was a crime. Let's use a murder again as an example. We knew who the perpetrator was because we had, let's say, an eyewitness who saw the crime and identified the perpetrator. But then something happened and we were unable to prosecute the case. Let me give you an example, unfortunately, that was one of my cases. We had a murder. I had an eyewitness who was an elderly gentleman who witnessed the crime, identified the perpetrator, and as we moved toward the trial, this gentleman died unexpectedly of natural causes, the only eyewitness. So now we knew we had a crime, we knew who the perpetrator was, but we didn't have admissible evidence to use in court to try to prove the crime beyond a reasonable doubt because the only eyewitness died unexpectedly. Now, all of those are easy examples of why prosecutors would decline to charge or bring a case. But frankly, most of the declinations involve gray areas. They involve circumstances where we know there's a crime, we believe we've identified the perpetrator, and the question becomes, do we have enough admissible evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. The DOJ standard, if we are to go to trial in a case, is we have to be convinced that we have a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits, enough admissible evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And friends, that is an art, not a science. That's not a math equation. If you ask 100 prosecutors whether a certain batch of evidence qualifies as proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you may get lots and lots and lots of different opinions. And as it is in that gray area where I think we experience the most challenges when it comes to prosecutorial decisions, whether to bring a charge or decline to bring a charge. So friends, against that backdrop, let's turn to the Gates case. Federal prosecutors investigated Matt Gates for allegations of sex trafficking of underage girls. And one of the main problems, one of the main challenges in the Gates investigation, as has been widely reported, is that the main cooperating witness was Gates' good buddy, Joel Greenberg. Joel Greenberg, who pleaded guilty to crimes that include, among others, underage sex trafficking, wire fraud, identity fraud, stalking, producing fake identification cards, conspiring to defraud the United States and others. Joel Greenberg, who was just sentenced in connection with his guilty plea uh, to 11 years in prison. And at the time of his sentencing, here's what the judge said about Joel Greenberg, quote, I have never seen a defendant who has committed so many different types of crimes in such a relatively short period 
said District Judge Gregory Presnell, who has been on the federal bench for decades and has sentenced more than 1,000 defendants. So yes, that would have been the prosecution's star witness against Matt Gates, a man whose credibility is lower than well droppings. Now to be sure, friends, as prosecutors, we often have to use witnesses who are career criminals, who are deeply damaged, who have extreme credibility deficits. That's not unusual because when you're prosecuting criminals, some of their best friends and their co-defendants, their co-conspirators, their associates are fellow criminals. So we understand that. However, you have to be able to, as we put it, clean up a cooperating witness. You have to corroborate them in every way you can. Get all sorts of other evidence that supports the conclusion that what they're telling you and ultimately what they'll have to tell a jury is credible, is truthful, is accurate. It can be proven with other evidence, not just the word of a deeply damaged cooperating witness. And I have to tell you, Joel Greenberg is more damaged than most cooperators in my experience, and I have a long history of working with cooperating witnesses. You know, Joel Greenberg is one of those people who, uh, pardon the joke, but you'll look at him and you'll see a whole bunch of little round bruises all over his body, and you'll, you'll say, why does he have little round bruises all over his body? Well, it's because nobody wants to touch Joel Greenberg except with the end of a 10-foot pole. Yes, he's an, he's an ugly, damaged, cooperating witness. And apparently the prosecutors decided that even though he was uh, Matt Gates' running buddy and could provide incriminating information against Matt Gates, they just decided his testimony wasn't enough. They may have decided he wasn't even the kind of witness they could put on the stand and ask a jury to credit. So that, I believe, posed a significant challenge for the federal prosecutors when they were debating whether they had enough evidence to indict Matt Gates. Here's another challenge, and there have been some rumblings about this. Um, sometimes when you have sex trafficking cases involving, for example, 16 and 17 year old girls who are being trafficked. Sometimes they don't feel like they're being trafficked. This is not to excuse anybody's conduct or the kind of abuse that is heaped on young victims, but sometimes the victims are, in their view, willing participants, maybe traveling across state lines with Matt Gates and he's treating them well, he's lavishing them with gifts. There was some reporting about the exchange of money. And there, has, there have been some rumblings that this investigation of Matt Gates' potential sex trafficking crimes involved a witness who was the victim of the sex trafficking who may have refused to cooperate with the authorities because perhaps she didn't view herself as a victim. I don't know that for sure, but I have heard some rumbling about that. And if that is the case, when you couple a, a victim who does not want to cooperate with the investigation or the prosecution with a really ugly criminal like Joel Greenberg, it may make for a case that the prosecutors believed they didn't have enough admissible evidence um, to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Maybe they concluded they did not have a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits. So all things considered, their assessment of the evidence may have led to the conclusion that we're not quite there and we just can't bring charges against Matt Gates. We don't know that for certain, but I think that is a reasonable possibility, maybe even a probability, that led to the conclusion that we can't indict Gates. Then there are some other possible explanations that are um, perhaps a little bit more troubling. What I will tell you in my decades with the Department of Justice is sometimes federal prosecutors are too cautious, too conservative, too timid even, when it comes to bringing difficult cases, challenging cases, particularly cases that may involve um, a maiden legal voyage, a novel area of law, 
or some outliers on the facts that we believe support the guilt of the defendant. And prosecutors, federal prosecutors, are not known as risk takers. A lot of them will run around beating their chest saying, I've never lost a case. And there is somebody who famously said, don't let me hear you say you've never lost a case because that's just an indication that you've never brought the difficult cases. Maybe you're doing a disservice to the American people by being too conservative, right? too timid in your prosecutorial approach and discretion. I've encountered that as a federal prosecutor. Then there's another phenomenon that's often at play. You know, I talked earlier about how, you know, as a federal prosecutor in the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, I prosecuted federal cases and local cases. Well, most jurisdictions have federal prosecutors and then separate state prosecutors. And when people commit crimes, it is all federal crimes, it is almost always the case that their conduct in violation of the federal law also violates state law. So federal prosecutors get to make the decision whether they want to exercise jurisdiction over particular crimes because the backup for federal prosecutors is let's just kick it to the state prosecutors because it violated state law as well. Let's let them prosecute it. And let me tell you, friends, in my experience, when you give people the ability to either accept additional work and exercise jurisdiction over a case, or perhaps decline to accept additional work and give it to somebody else like the state prosecutors, that is not necessarily um, the healthiest approach for a prosecutorial system, I'll put it that way. Um, I don't know that that phenomenon was in play in this case because I don't think there's a suggestion. I haven't heard any reporting that the feds are kicking this to the states, but that does happen sometimes. And here's one more difference between federal prosecutors and state prosecutors, and then we'll wrap up this Team Justice Law School class. Um, the federal prosecutors prosecute proactively. What does that mean? It means they prosecute in the way they just investigated the Gates case at length, sometimes at their leisure, sometimes too slowly in my experience, because nobody's been arrested. Gates wasn't arrested. They could investigate him in the grand jury forever. There's no deadline to make a prosecutorial decision. They investigate proactively after a crime has been committed but for, before anybody has been arrested. That that is, you know, that represents most of the federal investigations. States investigate reactively, by and large. What do I mean by that? There's a crime, an arrest is made, and the state prosecutors are in court. They don't have the luxury of investigating everything at their leisure in the grand jury to perfection before they decide whether to bring a charge or not. They prosecute reactively. They're always on the court clock. They have deadlines to abide by. The feds, not so much. They are by and large in control of their own schedule and when a case should or shouldn't be indicted. I don't want this to sound hypercritical. I was a fed for decades, but remember I also prosecuted local crimes, so I saw this dichotomy up close. I lived it for decades. And here's the thing. Because I was both a federal prosecutor and the local prose prosecutor in D.C. all rolled into one, guess what? If the federal prosecutors who handled only federal cases in my office, the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, wanted to kick it to the states, wanted to make it a state prosecution, or wanted to make it a state problem, they would kick it to me, to us, to their fellow prosecutors in that very office. This was not the federal prosecutors kicking it to the state prosecutors in Maryland or the Commonwealth's attorneys in Virginia. It was one-stop prosecutorial shopping. So I lived this distinction, this disparity between the way federal prosecutors do business and the luxuries they have and the way state prosecutors do business and the luxuries they don't enjoy. That's also true on the resources front generally. 
Feds have more resources, states typically have less. And friends, I don't want to leave this unsaid. When it comes to charging decisions, do federal prosecutors take into account the status of the target of the investigation? For example, is the target rich, connected, influential, powerful, white? Do prosecutors take that into account? Do those sorts of things factor into prosecutorial discretion? The question of whether to charge or decline to charge someone? I sure as hell hope not. Because if there's not equal justice, then there's no justice at all. And justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again soon.